Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all and a true privilege to speak before you again. Um, today's title is Mind, Information, or so to speak, Knowledge, and Consciousness and Attention all together. If you look at just the last 3,000 years of human history, what is absolutely clear is this exponential increase in the information that we can possess. So first of all, there was the unwritten history, and most of it disappeared, if for no other reason than impermanence. Then there is written history, and much of it we still don't know. How could we? As time passes, that history becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and no single person can fully acquire the records of the past, fortunately. Then came the printed word. And when print started, first wood blocks, then metal, and now laser, and who knows what else. Then we could multiply this information at will. And come the IT, the information technology age, and we are here in the 20th century with some of the greatest predicaments that human beings have ever faced. 200 years ago, an average human being absorbed, digested, and worked with as much information as you have in one week's edition of the New York Times, Sunday Double included. That's how much we had. And in fact, our brain could handle more, but not nearly as much as we had with the computer age or with the advent of these devices. Let me point out very quickly, there is no evil factor here. There is no conspiracy to get our attention. We are doing this to ourselves, and as long as we keep doing this to ourselves, this is the kind of mind quality that we have, that you can see on the subway every morning, on the buses, everywhere. <clears throat> Minds that are absorbed in virtual reality, paying very little attention even to themselves, let alone other people. In the old days, if you controlled an area, if you were a feudal lord, you had supremacy over that land. If you controlled the army, or the financial resources, or later the natural resources, you had control over that land. Now all of that, seems to become obsolete. What you need to control is information. So the fight for our attention begins with your focus. What do you focus on? What is it and who is it that grabs your focus? How well can you handle shifting focus or keeping your focus at a certain object or to a certain direction? So the biggest challenge nowadays is how we handle zeros and ones. How we handle the constant stream of information which becomes knowledge to the extent that we identify with it. Sometimes we seem to know too much. When you hear your ears buzzing or your vision sometimes becomes blurred, it means that your cognitive processes are so thick that you cannot really see clearly or hear clearly. If this goes into the extreme, we call it attention deficit disorder. It's so prevalent in the West that in the, in the UK, in America, that means the US at this point, but maybe even in Canada they open up clinics for the internet addicts or those who cannot deal with shifting focus or keeping focus respectively. That's when our tradition comes very handy. So far, I've briefly spoken about knowledge. And when we talk about Zen, we talk about don't know. When you fill your mind, you also have to have some skills to empty your mind. It's so obvious with your stomach. Why would it not be obvious with your consciousness? If your digestion stops, if you stop using the toilet, after a while you die. If our minds cannot digest content and cannot stop identifying with that content, it keeps growing, piling up, accumulating, 
to the very extent that you lose what we call mind space. What's that? Our original nature is clear like space, clear like a mirror. And when you have too many attachments to zeros and ones and thoughts and feelings, any kind of perception, any kind of action, any aspect of past, present, or future, if you identify in your mind with these, then soon your mind gets filled, your mind space is gone, and your mind mirror is tainted. How do you know that? The key word is stress. You feel stressed. Somebody just touches you a little bit, boom, you explode. Why did that happen? Distinct little bits and pieces of information that you paid attention in the last 20, 30, 40 years started to cut your consciousness into small little pieces, into small zeros and ones. And when your consciousness is too differentiated, sometimes too sophisticated, it becomes weak. And let me reassure you, strength or endurance so what I'm aiming at is not the lack of sophistication. It's not being crude or uncouth. When you practice don't know, you stop identifying with the unnecessary content in your mind. Your mind starts to digest your karma and you can empty it out. That means you get back to your original clear nature. And when that happens, you don't lose anything but the rubbish in your mind the illusions that you cannot rely on. And then you can handle your attention also very well. Naturally, you can pay attention to whoever you want, whatever you want, because there is no hindrance. But if your mind is weak, if your center is not strong, then you are always controlled and sometimes, in extreme cases, manipulated by the content of your own consciousness, should that be thoughts or feelings or anything else. What is a strong center? Everybody in this room is aware of our busiest junction, this, your cortex. That's where the zeros and ones are processed. That's your CPU, okay? Another busy junction is your heart, where your feelings coalesce. But very few of us are actually aware of this original point in the body and in the mind when your energy and your consciousness are not differentiated. They have not become feelings, speech, sensory perceptions, or thoughts just yet. And that is your navel chakra in Korean Tanjon, in Japanese Tanden, in Chinese Tantian. That is our original point, the point of don't know, and therefore our center. Now, if you focus on the moment and your Tantian at the same time, if you do this long enough, if you pay attention to the moment long enough, then the walls of your ego slowly, slowly are decreasing, and they are being pulled down by what? Simply by the fact that you do not put energy into that. What do I mean by not putting energy into your ego? Stop being judgmental. Stop identifying with your sensory perceptions, your memories. See clearly, hear clearly, taste, smell, touch, think, feel, act and speak clearly. And that clarity is only at this moment. Not in the past, not in a projected ideal present or in the future. If you support your own dualistic mind, your ego becomes stronger. If you see dualities as relative qualities, if you use your dualistic qualities to distinguish but not to discriminate, then everything is in place. We all have to distinguish between the floor and the wall, the water and the cup, but we do not judge them. We do not check them. We do not become attached to them. Memory is even trickier. Most of your neurosis, most of your traumas, 
would be easily resolved if you did not identify with your memory. But we do. We do not see our hard drive as separate from our CPU or other controllers, let alone the operator. And the job in our way, on our path, in Zen Buddhism is to find the operator of this computer, of this body and mind together. Classically, in Mahayana Buddhism, we have eight levels of consciousness. The first five are the first five physical senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, body as touch. Sixth is the mind. What kind of mind is that? That's your CPU, as I have mentioned earlier. That's where you form concepts. You make name and form. You create zeros and ones. You create your Excel chart. You do your word processing or your presentation. That's all your CPU, so very smart people have a very large and fast CPU. Next, your seventh consciousness is your distinctive or dualistic mind. That's where you and the world become separate. That's what you need for your survival. That's where your ego is formed. That's where our biggest misconceptions of good and bad are stored. But well, that's where our correct distinctions are stored as well. That's your seventh. That's what separates the water and the cup. And we need that. But if it's not clear, we go into judgments and arbitrary, absolutistic distinctions instead of clearly seeing white as white, red as red, human as human, animal as animal. The eighth is your hard drive. That's your memory. You store all your karma there. Everything that the first seven creates is stored in the eighth. That's our computer. That's the software and the hardware together. But none of that is the operator. Where is the operator? Who is the operator or what is the operator? What is not impersonal, is just realistic. The notion of who is created in the seventh consciousness. That's where your I is formed. And mind you, I'm not suggesting we are machines. We are sentient beings. But the best metaphor, commonly accessible and understandable in this world, is the computer that we created. And if we keep doing this, we create one level higher called AI, or artificial intelligence. When that happens, who knows? I don't want to suggest or repeat those clever sentences that many scientists or other sensitive people and sensible people drew up on your chalkboard. Namely, that this would be the last invention ever on Earth, or humanity would cease to exist, or we would be controlled by these intelligent machines. We honestly do not know. But one thing we know. If we know too much, we have to somehow attain don't know. If we have too much information, we have to defuse that ticking bomb of too much information. If we cannot pay attention, we have to regain the capability to pay attention. It's amazing what you can do with a little focus, or more focus, or just single-minded, undivided attention. If you meditate, you can all do that. Sometimes we have external means to focus for a brief period of time, either a high-speed car or a very meaningful aspect of our relationship or something interesting or exciting. Usually it's some kind of pleasure or power experience, either way, that would focus our attention for some time. Either giving or taking some kind of pleasure intensively, being in a powerful position or being subjected to some kind of external power. And then we have this intensity of attention, this intensity of life that somehow could give meaning to our existence. But unfortunately, the experience of pleasure and power alone will not do that. Our purpose in life stands on its own. 
And if you look deeper inside, you can find that. So these three words, beginning with the letter P, pleasure, power, or purpose, these are an imaginary evolutionary line of human consciousness. Not only that, these are significant of the three major schools of psychology, all coming from Vienna. Pleasure, assigned to Freud, power, assigned to Adler, and purpose, assigned to Frankl. The last one is not so well known. But he survived a concentration camp, put his work into practice, and created a school called Logotherapy, which has a very, very interesting approach to human life and death, for that matter. Do you find meaning or logos in it? And if you don't find it, where is it? If there isn't, can you give some meaning to it? So, last and final question before I take your questions is where does your mind go? It's very easy to see where our bodies came from, mom and a little bit of dad, and then how it exists, how we try to support it with food and drink and sleep and sports and whatnot, and where it goes, cemetery. So when that happens, where does your mind go? And when you were born, where did your mind come from? This kind of direction delivers something to you. It delivers a purpose you may not be aware of, but you are already living it. It makes you pay attention to this moment because that's where all the information is. All this information is accessible at this moment. So, if you don't pay attention, then what do you have? You have what we call lost mind. And that lost mind is sometimes shocked by some external or internal events. And thus, you are back at the moment by that shocking experience. If you don't lose your mind, you don't have the shock. Or if you still have something very strong coming at you, your center can absorb that shock because your reactive consciousness becomes less and less intense. Why is it so important? You stand somewhere at a bus stop and suddenly there's a very loud honk of a horn. And people who are lost somewhere, and so they, <gasps> they are in a mild shock. Someone who pays attention is not shocked by the horn. In fact, it's not dangerous to your life. If you are 100% at the moment, you may even perceive that there is a horn sound coming. It is possible. If you're not shocked easily, then you're not afraid. So if you pay attention, if your mind is clear, if you have the necessary information, but you do not have the unnecessary information, your fears will decrease. And along with that, your traumas, your neurosis, everything that you want to get rid of, but due to your own identification with that information, you are unable to let go. There's a huge market for stress reduction programs in the West. Also for many other kinds of therapy in the West. But as long as the notion of self, the unchangeable, immutable self is there, there are no durable results. And even Western therapists are now recognizing that. Check this out. Psychotherapy without the self. It's a very interesting subject. It has enjoyed a lot of publicity lately. And it seems that the combination of Eastern and Western thought, philosophy and meditation, finally is bearing some lasting fruit. It would certainly be welcome in our current situation when the mind quality of 7 billion human beings is easily visible in our common output as the fate of human species on this planet. You don't have to look far. Open your favorite homepage of the daily news. That's what we are doing to each other. That's what we are doing to ourselves. 
There is no single external control over us. This is something that we have to realize so as to take responsibility. If we do not take responsibility for our lives and deaths, we cannot walk on the path of awakening. Because we keep blaming something, someone outside of ourselves, an image, an idea, a projection for the fate that we seem to suffer, but keep making it by ourselves, for ourselves, and to ourselves. And when we start taking responsibility, that's when we begin to attain true freedom. There are many ideas about freedom. One is, I do whatever I want. That's children's freedom. Then I live the life that I want. That's a little bit more adult, but still a little bit selfish. Who do you live that life for? What do you live that life for? What do you really become the master of? So when you want true mastery, true attainment, it starts with skills, intention, determination, experience. All of that translates into being responsible for what you are, who you are, what you do, and how you live. So without responsibility, there is no true freedom. And when we take responsibility, then we can experience many kinds of freedom. So pay attention, clear your mind, get rid of the mind rubbish that you do not need but you still store. And don't worry, what you need remains there. Sometimes when people overuse, don't know, then they don't remember things that they used to remember. And that's when they become afraid. I started meditation, now what's happening to me? I forgot the number of pages where I was yesterday in my favorite book. Don't worry, the book is there, the bookmark is there, and if you open the book, you will open it on the page where you really want to be. We call that intuition. So when you clear off the unnecessary layers of your cognition and emotion, then something becomes live. And we call that intuition. Your intuition and willpower, they are centered in your tanjon or tantian. So if you practice correctly, then you know what you need to know and you don't know what you don't need to know. And you are regulating this without thinking. You have this already in your mind as your intuitive capability. So this is the reason why the Orient, which always emphasized experience first, is meeting the West, which emphasized knowledge first. It seems that if we want to get to the bottom of it, we have to articulate the experience and translate it into some kind of knowledge, something understandable. And if we want to use knowledge correctly, we have to have the experience, the reference of it. So if we do not experience what the knowledge is about, it's inert. If we only have experience but cannot communicate it, then we cannot help other people. So in this sense, in many ways, no matter how traumatic and troublesome the 20th century has been, it has merits that we can only see later. One merit is the combination of cultures, that we became actually a global village, that Eastern and Western thought, religion, science and society, they met, they have combined, and that evolution has not stopped ever since. So I hope that this was plenty for introduction, and now you would be kindly welcome to ask your questions, any kind of question, whatever you want. Uh, thank you very much for your kind uh, lecture for us. And I have some question about the pay attention. So I want, and uh, I always want to pay attention to do something, or. Uh, but it's very, very difficult for me as sometimes I want to pay attention to do my uh, work or uh, to pay attention to my study. But 
uh, it's very, very difficult to pay attention more than 30 minutes. So how should I do uh, to pay attention? Well, you're lucky because some people cannot pay attention even for 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> we call it the mouse click sickness. Because every click of the mouse actually releases hormones in the brain and that becomes a stream of excitement. So people cannot pay attention even for 30 seconds because they need another click. You are lucky because you can pay attention for 30 minutes. So then, if you extend that attention span, then you can pay attention for a longer time. And how do you do that? Everybody understands more or less meditation in this room. Meditation means your body and mind are at the same place, at the same moment. Your body and mind are connected with your breath. So if you just watch your breath, A, you can relax. B, your mind cleans itself naturally. C, you can pay attention. When we concentrate forcibly at a certain object or people, it's like clenching your fist. And you can try that, how long you can clench your fist. It has a limited time. But if you open your hand, you can hold your hand clearly, like a reflective you know, surface, for a, for a very, very long time. So I'm not talking about forced concentration. I'm talking about natural attention when you remove all the hindrances. And the hindrances are the divisions of the mind. So you cannot do that in the flesh or while you are doing you know, your work because then you have to perform. Just like a car, you cannot take it to the service station or car center when you have to go to Pusan with that car. Then the car has to perform. That's why we meditate every day in our home, at our temples, anywhere where we can do that. And we can do that anywhere. It doesn't depend on your physical position. It doesn't depend on your culture, creed, whatever condition you may have. So, start with your breath. Observe how your body and mind connect. When you observe your breath, what happens in the mind? Does your mind automatically shift focus to your thoughts, to your worries, to your to-do list, to your significant other? to your car, to your computer, to your phone. All these habits control us if we let that happen. If not, we can have anything and everything and everyone in our lives without the distraction. If you are distracted, then there's also destruction too. So remove the hindrances and naturally this kind of attention, which is very durable, is yours. All it takes is training. And that training is actually very enjoyable. Why? If you are clearer and stronger than another human being, you win. This may sound strange. This is not a competitive course. But if you look at the practical application in a tight situation, who is it that can win? The one with better mind quality and skills, etc., etc. Fundamentally speaking, it is your mind quality that decides over your actions, your speech, your thoughts, and your feelings, your emotions. That mind quality is synonymous with clarity, strength, oneness, therefore the ability to pay attention. So just train. And if you train, then everything happens naturally by itself. We call that training don't know. Attain, don't know. Attain the mind which is before thinking, <clears throat> before any appearances. And when you have that mind, then you have mind space, mind mirror. In that mind space, you can make decisions better. Imagine that somebody is running towards you from the door, but you only see it in the last meter. Can you jump? No, you can't. It's too short. But if you hear the person already coming up the staircase, running, then charging at you, you have plenty of time to make some countermeasures. Your mind operates in the same way. Clear mind, open mind means you have a choice. 
you are controlled by your own habits, your mind mirror is not clear, that means you don't have a choice or you don't seem to have a choice. Because you lack the very instrument which you need to make that choice. If you have a mirror, and that mirror is undistorted and clear, you can use it. Your face, your clothes, everything is reflected in it. But if somebody writes on that mirror with a lipstick, then wherever that writing is, the mirror is not reflective. Even if this sentence, I love you, if it's written on the mirror, can blindfold that mirror. Okay, that's how attachments work. So, keep the mind mirror clear. Keep your center strong. Keep your mind space open and wide. Then everything comes naturally and everyone comes naturally. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Very when good. I want to make space in my mind, and when I have too much in my mind, how do I know that I made a good decision in sorting the many things in my mind? First choice, second choice, third choice. How do I know that I did not make any mistakes? By cause said, and effect. Sorry? If you see cause and effect, then you know. But you want to know in advance. Yes. I want to know that it, um, I did not make any uh, um, false decisions. Mm -hmm. I hope that um, I will not make any, uh, I would not have any regrets about my decisions. In sorting the choices, first choice, second choice, uh, okay. what, what, what do I have to put apart? Okay. How Understood. do I know? First of all, knowledge and experience together, they are pretty good guides. You have lived long enough to have first-hand experience. What is life? How it works? What is a human relationship? However, if you look inside to the extent that you understand yourself, to that extent you can understand another human being. If you truly see how your mind works, you see how the world works. So look inside and ask this question, what is this? Where does this come from? And then you see cause and effect inside. And when you see cause and effect, you can rely on that experience and you can make a good decision based on that. However, if you want to make a theory, some kind of predictive analysis, it's not going to work. So do not want to be theoretical. Do not want to remove yourself, you know, from the actual situation. Be in the situation or relationship. Be clear and use everything that you have experienced so far inside and outside to keep that decision correct. Sometimes you have to stop and not make any decisions. And we call that not moving body not moving speech, not moving mind. And that is meditation in its formal sense. So when you truly want to attain our substance, what it is that makes decisions, what or who is the operator of our supercomputer of sentient being, then you formally do the meditation from zero minutes to 30, 40, 50, and repeating this as many times as you possibly can. We call that the meditation retreat or meditation training. So when that happens, then what we read in the Heart Sutra, no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no realm of eyes, visual perceptions, and until no realm of mind consciousness. That means that the slightest notion of your ego can also be wiped out. And there's only this moment, only the sounds, only your time and space as you are. And that is an experience which is very basic, very clear, but very unfamiliar to most of us. Because the moment we have some mind space, we want to fill it. Fill it with something to read, to enjoy, some movies, some music, whatever. And it's all okay. 
but do we know the very foundation of our existence or the foundation of our decision making? Do we see the basis? Do we attain what it is that makes that decision in fact? If you meditate, you can do that. That's when knowledge and experience combine. And if your meditation is done correctly, then you finish your formal part and meditation continues outside in everyday life. Then you recognize your situation correctly, establish relationship correctly, and do correct action also. Not just physical action, but correct speech, correct thinking, correct emotions. How do you see that? Because you achieve the purpose. And the purpose is not just for yourself, but for all beings. Not just helping yourself, but helping all beings. Not just solving your problems, but helping other beings solve their problems. So that's how you can measure whether your decision was correct or not. Did it take away that kind of problem that you wanted to solve? Did it resolve the suffering that used to be there? And if yes, you did it. If not, you have to adjust and make the decision in a different fashion, somehow adjust it to the new situation. There is no single theory that can help you assess this. But you have you, yourself, your own true nature, your clear Buddha mind, which is already present in all of us. And that is something we can attain and use. And that is the ultimate decision maker and also the mirror where you can see the results of your decisions. So see clearly, hear clearly, think, feel, taste, smell, touch, act clearly. And that clarity is it. There is no other predictive medium. Okay? I have one question. Uh, I read... Uh an article a month ago, uh, famous, venerable, uh, um, wrote the, the, uh, his assertion for the Buddhism. So in the West, in the West um, not, not West, uh, he's saying Buddhism is not religion. And um, in the West, uh, nobody interested in religion. That is the uh, second point. Then, what is Buddhism to, to us? He, says, he said, that's a science. So, my question is that, uh, uh, what is your view on his, um, on his saying about the Buddhism? Uh, does Buddhism has a religious uh, uh, spirit or aspects? To you or West, what just a science? Do you hear the sound? The sound of the aircon. Can you pay attention to this sound? This attention, is it religion or science? So you make religion, you have religion. You make science, you have science. When you listen to this sound, that's neither science nor religion. You make religion that you want to worship something or someone. You can do that. Religare means linking again. Reconnecting earth and heaven. Reconnecting humans and God or gods. But it's based on a lot of assumptions. The problem with religion is that you have to take things for granted, which I personally never could. For me, Buddhism is neither religion nor science. My father was a scientist, never believed in anything else than sensory, physical. My uncle was an Adventist priest. He believed in God and uh, everything and everyone, you know, next to him. And I had both men in my lives, one as a physical and scientific father, and the other is like a spiritual father. Who do I believe? So for me, Buddhism is neither religion nor science. It's a way. It's in its origin. It's a path. 
It's a path on which we can walk. Originally, Buddhism means don't make anything. Don't make anything. Don't make religion. Don't make science. Hear the sound as it is. See a human being as he or she is. Truly seeing this world as it is and ourselves as we are is called tathata or suchness in the Buddha's teaching. In that suchness, there is neither religion, nor science, nor mythology, nor eschatology, nor history, sociology, politics, whatever. We make all that. But the original teaching is don't make anything. Remember the sixth patriarch? When he was going to be patriarch, he was still Hengja. Nobody and nothing in the temple. Then Shen Siu, the great head monk of the fifth patriarch's temple, wrote his poem upon the bidding of the fifth patriarch on the wall. And he says, Body is Bodhi tree, mind is clear mirror stand. Completely clean, 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 constantly, never let dust settle. Now this is very Buddhist. And this is wonderful. It's very practical. But no Hengja, who later became Huineng, went even one more step deeper. And that depth is something we need right now. He says, Bodhi has no tree. Clear mirror has no stand. Originally nothing. Where is dust? Originally nothing. Where is religion? Where is science? Where is all of this which is made by human beings? Made by us. But what are we? Who are we? And that is something that we can attain if we stop making all this. You want to walk on the path? Don't make anything. Don't hold on to anything. Don't attach to anything. Don't identify with anything. See karma clearly. See cause and effect in accordance with reality. And then we can walk on the path of attaining our substance, perceiving truth, and correctly functioning as human beings. More questions? Uh, I, I want to know uh, the population uh, uh, Buddhist population in Europe countries, uh, 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 the trend. If I say, if I ask uh, another, another, there are another more word. and more Buddhist babies born. I know. Uh, uh, <laughs> How would so, I know the population? So, uh, I don't know. So uh, these days, uh, uh, I, I'm uh, I'm working in uh, as a volunteer guide. I'm working in uh, Joge Temple uh, in information. Uh, Information center for foreigners. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I meet uh, many uh, Western people who want to know uh, the Buddhism and who want to experience yeah. the uh, temple stay uh, in, in Korean temple. So uh, I, I wanted to know uh, what is the trend of Buddhism, for example, uh, more people in Western people want to know. This trend doesn't yeah. help you teach mm. Westerners when they appear in your information center. What helps is knowing your own tradition, your own Korean Buddhism. Yes. And I think personally that the biggest task for any of you is to have Westerners actually experience the essence of Korean meditation practice. Mm. They can be tourists, they can behave very well. They follow the rules. They can stay through the temple stay schedule from day to night and wake up 3 a.m. and have the yebul and the meditation, the ceremony and whatnot. What do they get? Do they remain tourists? Or do they have a taste of practice as well? So give them that taste. Organize temples not just with external programs. There are many nice programs and very wonderful movies, clips, books, and homepages about that. What do these people get? Do they get the essence, at least a peak of it, a little taste of it, or they remain tourists? 
Now, the job of any teacher, not just here, but also when I receive guests or the Won Kwangsa family in Hungary receives guests from any part of the world, because we do have Europeans, Koreans, Americans, many people visiting us. Do we just treat them as visitors, tourists, or we treat them as potential practitioners with full respect to their own decision if they don't want to be? So our path is very interesting. It brings out all the paradoxes. If I reveal the path to you, I shouldn't convince you. If I don't reveal the path to you, I make a mistake. I don't use the potential. If I overuse the potential, then someone feels that, oh, they wanted to convert me. In Buddhism, there's nothing to convert to and no one to convert. Remember that. That's why when we chant that we are together with Buddha, it's very important because his true nature, our true nature, same true nature. But our karma is different. Our minds are different. But our true nature, our potential for awakening is exactly the same. In light of that, my humble suggestion is that we shouldn't just treat tourists, whether Western or Asian, as uh, potential entries to a temple state program. Not even someone who might be interested in Buddhism and we want to tell them something right away. We might begin with some introductory, of course, but after a while, it's very useful to ask whether they have any questions. What are they truly interested in? And start there. Start exactly where their interests are. So if they are interested in going to temples, then show them the options. If they are interested in tea ceremony, right here, first floor, there's tea ceremony. Whatever they want to do is their will, their intent. And that willpower, that intent carries their energy. Because it's their decision. Now, if you can educate that decision, then you have done the job. But we educate that decision to the extent that these people want to accept that. Why? We do not interfere. We inform, we educate, we elevate if we can, but we do not interfere in other people's internal affairs, their lives, their karma, their decisions. It's theirs to make. Why? We respect them. We respect them as potential Buddhas. We respect them that they can make correct decisions. And we never want to take away their freedom. Rather, sometimes wake up their sense of responsibility for their decisions. And that's how we can help them become free. Remember responsibility and freedom, how they go hand in hand? So awake a sense of responsibility. Then that gives them freedom. And we went way beyond just a casual meeting. So you have already given them something that, may, that they may have never gotten through books or programs or just going from point A to point B because this approach turns that energy inwards and encourages them to look inside and ask, what do I want? What do I want to do? Maybe the next couple of days, the next couple of months, or next couple of lifetimes. What do I really want to do? What do I follow? Do I follow pleasure, power, purpose, any combination of this? How much? To what end? Plenty of chance. Plenty of potential. So you do your own practice and do your service to society and everything is naturally in place. Now in Korea, uh, people's lives are threatened by the uh, Mers, the virus. Yeah. Every uh, living thing has consciousness. I mean, the uh, say, cat has uh, cat consciousness, dog has con dog con consciousness, and then the virus is also living thing. At least it has uh, DNA or RNA. So we cannot say that is something, the material or something. Then they might have the consciousness also. 
And in Korea, old people want to contain the virus, suppress, and eventually eliminate them. Then does it cause karma, killing the uh, living thing? Yes, of course. It causes the karma of killing the MERS virus, but by the way, I haven't heard that they found any vaccine or cure against it. So they can try, but it mutates very quickly. And there is no clear antidote because they cannot define the antibodies that you need for that. So killing a virus is a conscious choice. Otherwise, the virus kills a human being or maybe some other being. And if you use the principle of less suffering rather than more suffering, then in this case, you can justify that. And sometimes that justification is necessary. Don't just look at mass. Look at the way we eat. I mean, how many sentient beings did we have to kill just last week to support our own bodies? So, again, the lower the consciousness level, the smaller the harm is. In case of viruses and bacteria, even as we breathe, we kill them because the oxidization in our lungs kills hundreds and thousands of them, just as we are. So it's life on Earth. It's just a fact of life on Earth. To the extent that we can do something about it, we should. But being altruistic to a virus and letting viruses kill human beings, that's not really following neither logic nor nature. Meditation is to extend our clear mind. Yeah. Is it, is it true? Right? Attain and extend, yes. Yeah. Uh, during meditation, sometimes I have a, a, a state of mind, uh, no, no, no thinking, no thinking, and I think it's a, one kind of a clear mind. But uh, I became soon, uh, I think it is uh, some boring. I, I feel it's uh, boring. Uh, clear mind is no thinking about anything, and because of that, I, uh, it's very difficult to keep uh, the uh, Boring the is not clarity. Boring is a reflection of something yeah. that you At don't first understand. At first, I uh, can keep the uh, clear mind. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's uh, no thinking and very uh, good uh, state, status. But uh, soon, I... I became boring about the because there's no thinking. But understood. My mind is uh, uh, mm. again. Some, do not identify with that reflection, uh -huh. because when you start to think, uh -huh. then sitting, unmoving, not doing anything, not speaking to anyone, that can be boring after a while. But uh -huh. if you meditate, uh -huh. then there is no thinking at all. Mm. And boring is thinking. It's a reflection. It's yeah. saying that, uh, that means not interesting. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. But if you want interesting, then go to a movie, read a book, call someone. That's very different. But when you work on the basis, the foundation of your own mind, mm -hmm. it's really just clear, cleaning the mirror. Mm -hmm. When you clean the mirror, there's nothing interesting before the mirror. And that's okay. If you think about meditation, then it's terrible. <laughs> if you don't think about meditation and you just do it, mm -hmm. then all thinking comes back to zero. And there is no boredom. No boredom because you don't make it. So boredom mm -hmm. is just the tip of the iceberg. If people think about the Buddha Dharma and they think about emptiness too much, they can become depressed, they, they can become nihilistic, they can have many disorders. And sometimes they ask me, that if people meditate and they have this, how come that 2,500 years the teaching survived and flourished and went to many countries? I always have to say, the Buddha's teaching does not involve being bored, depressed, nihilistic, or developing other disorders of the kind. It's somebody's reflection or reaction to certain aspects of practicing. And it doesn't have to be there. So if you see how boredom arises, stays, and then goes away, 
then you can also see that it's made by your own mind. So if you don't make anything, you return to this point of don't know, then there's only this moment in its clarity. Then boredom can never happen. Never. Try to put very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, Again, I, I, if you make uh, difficult, you have difficult. I think you know the uh, good way uh, well, uh, how, well to, how to keep the... Something I have to reveal for you. I was never bored during meditation. Mm. I have to say that very sincerely. If I was, I would also tell you how I could overcome that. But I was never bored for the last 25 years during meditation. Sometimes <laughs> I was busy. Sometimes I had to go to places and I had to kind of wait until the clock strikes and then go. There were many reflections in my mind. This computer is also working, so why not? But I was never bored. If you watch your breath, if you watch your body, if you watch your mind, you observe, you pay attention to these three, how these three become one at this moment, how your mind just spools off all your thoughts, how things change inside and outside is the most interesting thing ever. There is no Hollywood director that can make that happen for you. But you can, simply by observation. This observation power is the foundation of attention, focus, and sometimes even very high-class execution of certain tasks or very complex problems. Okay? So, if you're bored, ask yourself, where does this come from? Then you're not bored anymore. <laughs> More questions? I came to Korea not so long ago, so I'm kind of a beginner in all these thoughts that you're the talking about. Um, I just realized that in all my life to make my stress go down, I made noise around me, I turned <clears> on the TV, I listened to music, and now as I kind of stayed, stayed in silence, the thing that happens is what you said, that all these things which are bothering me are coming back. And um, I kind of read about meditation and I went to temples, they tried to get some information. But in the very moment when I try, I just get more stressed because I feel that these thoughts, these bothering thoughts are even louder when I stay in silence. And I don't know if it's kind of a natural process and way to reach something. It is, something, but the approach or... for you is not yet complete. You mm -hmm. can have way more kind of tools that you haven't used yet, obviously. But let me ask you a question. You say you're staying in silence. In Korea, where? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Show me that place. Yeah. <laughs> Even on the most remote mountaintop, you hear something. The nearest freeway or the fighter jets, or some other airplane, or cars, or trains, or other people screaming, you know? So you cannot really be silent, but you yourself stopped making the noise yes, that would distract I'm in silence you. silence that I don't make my own That's my own the noise. point. Yes. So I teach you how to make correct noise. We call that mantra. And that mantra practice in Korean Jinon or Yombul that helps you clean out this junk that we have. There's a rule. If you want to clear thinking away with thinking, you make it worse. So don't put thinking over thinking over thinking over thinking because it's a mess. Is that what happens? <laughs> so you take the energy out by focusing on your Tantian. And I suggest that you learn some shorter or longer mantras. One of them can be the Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisattva, which is at the end of the Heart Sutra. It's all over the internet, etc. You can learn it, recite it, etc. And if you like, you can go to Korean temples and learn the chanting there. It's beautiful. It's pentatonic. It's polyphonic. Comes to the heart, from the heart. Awesome. Now don't stop at the mantra. Also, if you, if you are into meditation, then do some bows. That bows, the prostration, is not a mere act of worship. 
In fact, it's partially external. We do respect Buddhas and patriarchs who were before us and did all this so that we could talk about enlightenment and correct human life today. So it's partially an expression of respect. But it's also bowing by and to the Buddha nature inside you. And by bowing, you make your ego smaller and you resort back to your Buddha nature, which has no size. So we cannot say that the Buddha nature is big, then your ego is small. It's like children, you know, talking. Why? We have body, speech, and mind. We have to use all these three channels extensively if we want to get rid of this noise and become clear and pay attention correctly, make correct decisions, choose a correct direction, a partner, a job, you name it. So then bowing clears away karma in a physical way. Because you do elevate the Buddha above yourself, your Buddha nature above the karma that you can still carry. The other is speech. That's why the mantra. And the other is the mind. That's why the question. What is this? Where does this come from? Now, bowing works like breaking ice. Chanting works like boiling the water. And sitting meditation works like just blowing away the clouds with wind. Now, if you have an iceberg, no matter how strong the wind is, there is no short-term result. So that's why people with a lot of thinking, a lot of karma, lots of emotions, bowing is very important. And chanting, also very important. That's why in our temple, in Europe, we do all the three of them. Most of the students are lay people, 99%. They come in, they have all their problems, their noise, their unresolved things inside. It's boiling. Most people, if they start sitting right away, they would try to suppress this and be a good Buddhist or a good meditation practitioner, and that would make things wor worse. See, thinking suppressed by thinking, feeling suppressed by feelings, or the other way around. Either way, suppression doesn't work. Discipline works, but discipline is not suppression. We all know that. You just have to cultivate your garden a little bit and see how you have to weed things out and not to compress them back to the ground. So, bowing, chanting, sitting. Three major channels. And if you use them with some good assistance or teaching, then you can progress. And you don't have to have all the malaise, all the side effects of meditation, which people you know, have in the West. One thing which I have to emphasize is that when people really, really, really ambitiously sit down and they haven't bowed before, haven't chanted before, then suddenly their chi goes up to their heads because that's where their energy concentrates. In Korean, it's called sanggi or rising chi. It's very dangerous. The more energy you have, the bigger shock you can get in your cranium or sometimes in your heart. And the natural occurrence of these, when it's not during meditation but due to some illness, is heart attack and stroke. So I'm saying meditation is a very powerful tool. We shouldn't mistake it for a toy. But if you use correct instructions and you have a teacher you trust, a teaching that you can follow, and a group of practitioners that you fit in, you have the three important parts of our tradition. In, the, in Asia, we call it the three treasures. Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. You need all these three. Plus the other three with body, speech, and mind. And if you have these internally, externally, very rare that people would go wrong. Very rare. Okay? okay You're you. welcome. So I want to appreciate your presence and precious attention this afternoon uh, for the Dharma Instructors Association, their sustained support and kind invitation. And I sincerely hope that in the future we can meet and practice together and share the Dharma again and make this place a little bit better world and help each other attain a little bit more awakened mind as human beings. Thank you very much.